So why don't we get started to maximize our time. Um, today's speaker, um, the cultural psychiatry track in the Department of Psychiatry, is very happy to present. Jonathan Metzel is an MD-PhD. Uh, Frederick B. Rentschler II, Professor of Sociology and Medicine, Health and Society, and the Director of the Center for Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University. He's also a Professor of Psychiatry and a Research Scholar at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, he does research and he's also a practicing psychiatrist. Um, and he does research in the areas of history of psychiatry, race, health, and gender. He got a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2008, and he's written extensively for medical, psychiatric, and popular publications. Uh, his books include what he's going to talk about today, The Protopsychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease. He's also written about gender and psychiatry and Prozac on the couch. And another recent book of his, Against Health, How Health Became the New Morality. And also he added a difference in identity in medicine. So very happy to have Jonathan Metzel with us today. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. It's really my great honor to be here today and to have spent a couple of days uh, in, in the department here. It's really very encouraging uh, for me as someone who spent my career uh, at the intersection of kind of culture and psychiatry to see all of the very positive and, and, and uh, innovative things that are, that are happening here in the training of psychiatrists and in, in, in the department itself. So thank you very much. Um, as Ippy just mentioned, uh, the, the work that I've done really does look at the nexus. Can people hear me, by the way? Like, okay, um, at the nexus between uh, psychiatry and culture and society. And the first book, or the first project that I did was a book called Prozac on the Couch. And that was a history of kind of cultural representations of depression. And I looked at representations of depression and things uh, ranging from, um, oh, perfect. Uh, I looked at representations of depression and things ranging from um, pharmaceutical advertisements to memoirs about depression. Uh, to popular films and other kinds of media. And to make a kind of long story short from that project, what I found was, uh, probably no surprise to anybody, but that in, at least in representations of depression in American mainstream culture between 1950 and really the end of the 20th century, that there was a kind of prevalent and kind of global assumption that depression was a kind of white woman's illness. And so one example of that is that I looked at pharmaceutical advertisements from the American Journal of Psychiatry and Archives of General Psychiatry and looked at advertisements for antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs. And at least in er early antidepressant ads, you didn't see a person of color show up for about the first 50 years until 1997. Um, and you could say, well, maybe that's a good thing that people aren't being shown in antidepressant ads or something. But it did play to this familiar assumption about race and gender that was prevalent, I think, in, as I argue in that project, in a lot of representations about depression. So I wondered as I was doing that project, is it the case that American culture broadly was just in the 50s uh, to the present day kind of constructing mental illness more broadly as a kind of whiteness discourse? And uh, over the course of the research in that project, little kind of snippets that would come up that would kind of trouble that and would suggest that there was a different conversation going on about race. Uh, but it wasn't the depression conversation, it was the schizophrenia conversation. And so I, I would come across little things like um, there was a term in the 40s and 50s people might know called slum psychosis, this assumption that schizophrenia was an illness that spread like a virus in urban slums, and other kind of evidence that I'll be talking about today. And so for me that set off a different kind of uh, research where I was really trying to look at the relationship between race and racialized diagnostic patterns and schizophrenia itself. And as somebody who's trained as a cultural historian, historian, what I did first in that project was try to find an archive. And I spent several years trying to find an, an archive. And ultimately, what I uh, was lucky enough to find were um, archived records from a particular hospital called the Ionia State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Now, Ionia is a small town uh, in, in kind of northernish Michigan. Anybody here from Michigan by any chance? All right, so people, uh, you know, I, I get in trouble when I say northern Michigan. It's actually not in northern Michigan. It's just north of where I used to live. Um, but um, but it's not a town that people, a lot of people have heard of in Michigan now. It's about two hours north of Lansing. But I will say that if you were in the American mainstream in the 19... 30s, 40s, or 50s, you definitely would have heard of Ionia because it was home to the nation's, one of the nation's leading hospitals for the criminally insane. This was a hospital that people were sent to after 
being convicted of some kind of crime, but then uh, being found to be mentally ill or insane in, in some form or another. And I went down to the, after you know, a, quite a prolonged period of getting access to the particular medical records, I went down to the, to the, to the archives and I was pulling charts um, extensively, actually over a couple of year uh, period, with the, with the specific purpose of looking at the differences in patterns about the diagnosis of schizophrenia at the time. And what we found and what the kind of central uh, argument of my book kind of revolves around was the fact that basically in these archives, when we, when we pulled charts from the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, and we basically just said, you know, we had control groups too, but it was kind of like, who had schizophrenia in this hospital? And we would pull charts. We found increasingly, increasingly that these were charts of women who, according to the hospital census system, were categorized as what was called U.S. white, that was the category that nine out of 10 of the patients with schizophrenia had. And about seven out of 10 of the cases were categorized as women. So schizophrenia, at least in this hospital, the criminally insane, was, was presented in the charts as being an illness of kind of white women. And these women were all from rural areas, kind of pastoral areas around in kind of rural Michigan. And it was almost kind of humorous, the kind of um, crimes that they got convicted of. It was stuff like shoplifting, or our personal favorite was creating a public disturbance and embarrassing your husband in public, which I guess was found to be a crime at the time. And they would um, get, get, get uh, admitted to the hospital and, and uh, convict and, and, and then be diagnosed with schizophrenia. And what we found was that if we did the same thing in the 1960s and 70s and basically just pulled charts for schizophrenia from the 60s and 70s, all of a sudden women like this didn't show up in the charts at all. And part of that was that the hospital became an all-male facility in the late uh, 1960s, but increasingly people who are categorized as U.S. white weren't getting diagnosed with schizophrenia. And instead in the charts, we found increasing people uh, who were diagnosed according to the census of the hospital as being in a category called U.S. Negro. Uh, and oh, um, again, this was probably seven out of 10 of the charts were categorized that way. And these were all men. And these were men who weren't convicted of like embarrassing their husbands, obviously, or other kinds of things. Instead, they were convicted of things like armed robbery or homicide attempt, but probably one of the more prevalent di uh, crimes that we saw them convicted of was civil disobedience, and particularly civil disobedience around the Detroit riots and, and being members of the black protest groups and stuff like that. And so that really became the kind of central story of the book was how was it that these African-American men who were not from rural areas, they were from Detroit and Chicago, who were uh, in many cases really protesting as, as part of militant protest groups, how was it that these guys ended up in a psych hospital diagnosed with schizophrenia? And over the course of the research, it really kind of became clear in going through the charts that there were two levels of story going on here. One level was that there was an individual tragedy happening here, which was that it was really, really, really heartbreaking stuff. A lot of these guys had families. Some of them actually were in the military and were just home on leave and were kind of, you know, furloughed or something like that and were taken up off the streets, passed through the prison system and ended up being in mental hospitals for periods much longer than their, than their uh, criminal offenses. So a lot of times they would get convicted and have like a two to five year sentence. But because the, the criteria for the mental hospital were until restored to sanity, a lot of these guys spend the rest of their lives in these institutions. So on one hand, there really was a tragic individual story, but there was also a broader cultural story that was happening in which these cases all became kind of metaphors in a way for a broader story about the nexus or what happens at the nexus between kind of race and culture and politics and psychiatry. And so with that as a bit of a preamble, I'll maybe step back a little bit into the present day and say that as Ippy just said, I'm somebody who actually like a kind of schizophrenic mind. I have a very split life uh, at Vanderbilt. Uh, and so if you go to me on the days that I'm in the psychiatry, psychiatry department, um, Monday, and you say, what is schizophrenia? I will say, like a good uh, practitioner of, uh, of our profession, that I believe schizophrenia, at least according to the current version of the DSM, is an illness that has symptoms including delusions, hallucinations, paranoia, social withdrawal. And these symptoms all are the result of a series of de developmental and environmental co -found, uh, confounders but they also result at some level uh, because of some kind of underlying biological substrate. And they're different, you know, obviously argumentative 
points we could take about that. Maybe it's the result of genetics, maybe it's the result of um, neurotransmitters or brain size or brain density, something like that. But there's some, uh, how, somehow underlying these symptoms is some kind of biological aberration. And um, if, uh, you know, I, I speak to humanities uh, audiences a lot and I tell them there is one interesting, in terms of the biology of schizophrenia, one interesting finding that's actually been present in psychiatric textbooks since the 1960s, actually, which was that, and actually it's just been complicated pretty recently, but at least for a good 40 or 50 year period, this assumption that because of genetics, and I'm quoting from uh, psychiatric, from Kaplan and Sadek for about a 30 or 40 year period, that because of genetics, schizophrenia is an illness whose prevalence should, according to biological science at least, be about 1% of the world's population. In other words, this is an illness that because there's some kind of underlying biological substrate, should occur in all people in some kind of prevalent pattern that is equal no matter where you live or what kind of music you like or how you dress or anything like that. that this is an aberration that's happening beneath the levels of culture or race or, 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 um, uh, or, or gender even. Um, now, that's the biological part. I'll say that if you come up to me on the days where I'm a sociology professor, I'm, um, you know, uh, being a humanities guy or something like that, and you ask me what is schizophrenia, which is, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for me in Vanderbilt, uh, you might be wondering what am I doing on Tuesday, and I've yet to <laughs> figure that out myself. Um, uh, I will say that I'm still somebody who's a practitioner of psychiatry. So I still believe there is a real biological thing called schizophrenia. I believe that thing warrants as aggressive treatment as we can muster, uh, including social support and medications and other kinds of issues. But I would also say that if you look at schizophrenia from a sociological perspective, that there are places where what we might think of very grossly as the biology of schizophrenia and the sociology of schizophrenia are in tension. And there are two places that I want to highlight today. And one is, basically, you don't even have to worry about this slide. I'll just tell you that if you're an African-American man, American man in the United States, you can pretty much pitch that 1% number out the window. Because if you're a black man in the United States, you're anywhere from 3, 4, 5, 6, even 7 times more likely to be overdiagnosed with schizophrenia and underdiagnosed with a series of conditions including depression, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorder, et cetera. So here's one place. And actually, this finding for people who know it, I'll, I'll say in a sec, but it's been prevalent in the literature for a very long time. But here's one place where we might think of at least a tension between an argument that's basically saying that this is an illness that occurs at a substrate beneath the level of, you know, of culture, and that basically culture in some ways is possibly shaping the material reality of who gets schizophrenia. And as I was mentioning, this is a finding that's been prevalent in the literature for a very long time. The first of these studies was actually done in 1967, at least published in the psych literature, and the most recent was two months ago in, in the, uh, published in the archives. Uh, so again, this is something that's been present for a very long time. A second and related, we might call it cultural stigmatization or misperception or, 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 or something like that, is the stereotype that people with schizophrenia are unduly hostile or violent. Now, of course, this stereotype really needs very little explanation for people in this room. Uh, I will say that, you know, for example, for people, I, I live in New York part of the time here, and there's always kind of episodes of Law and Order filming, uh, like, on the block where I live and stuff like that. And if you've ever watched an episode of Law and Order and you watch the first five minutes and somebody with schizophrenia shows up, you can pretty much go do your laundry and make your dinner and come back because the person with schizophrenia invariably is shown to be like the killer in just pretty much every episode. This is like 90% of the Law and Order episodes. Um, but I would say that this stereotype of people with schizophrenia as being violent is something that's, that's prevalent across a wide swath of American uh, culture. Here's a study from Psych Services from a couple of years ago by Watson, Corrigan, and Adati. And basically what they did is they gave a series of vignettes to experienced police officers in the Chicago area. And basically what they did is they gave a series of two kinds of vignettes to these police officers. One vignette basically said something like, Bob and Sam get into a fight. Bob pushes Sam and tears his coat. You're called to the scene. What do you do? The second vignette said, Bob and Sam get into a fight. Bob has schizophrenia. Bob pushes Sam and tears his coat. You're called to the scene. What do you do? So in a way, t two almost exactly identical vignettes. The only thing they do is, is vary whether or not the perpetrator did or did not have schizophrenia. And also the authors make clear that the vignettes did not show anything more than what they called minimally intrusive violence. So it wasn't anything like... Bob has a sawed-off shotgun, he's running down Main Street, blasting it in the air, anything like that. And what they found was very interesting, which was that simply by adding the word schizophrenia to the vignette, 
the police officer's perception that the perpetrator was violent went from about 15 percent to about 65 percent, a strongly statistically significant shift, even though nothing else in the vignette was changed whatsoever. It was simply by adding that term. And it wasn't just that the, that the perception of violence went up. It was also that the police officers were far more likely to mandate some kind of legal control, so to say, this person should be incarcerated, this person should, uh, you know, something like that. And uh, it was just really interesting to see that, that just by adding this one term really changed their perception of, of, of the violence of, of the person itself. Now, you might be thinking this is something that's particular to the police, but there are great studies by, for example, uh, Lincoln Phelan at, at Columbia that show that basically this this is also a, a prevalent stereotype, not just in specific professions, but also across a, 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 you know, a wide swath of, a, of American culture. Now, I don't want to say that people with mental illness don't uh, sometimes get, get convicted of crimes, but it's interesting to see the sensationalized over-representation of those crimes in the media. People here might know uh, the media studies scholar Otto Wall's work, and he basically argues that if somebody with schizophrenia somehow commits some kind of illness, um, that, 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 that uh, some kind of crime, that that crime is about 700 times more likely to show up in the news. So a real dramatic overrepresentation. Now, I call these cultural misperceptions for a couple of reasons. One, this is a surprise to people when I talk in popular audiences, um, but there's no blood test uh, or brain scan or anything that I can do that shows that uh, according to biology, now of course culture co complicates this, but there's no biological test that any of us can do that says that basically anybody w uh, of any particular racial or ethnic group is more likely than anybody else to get schizophrenia. So in that sense, this idea of race-based misdiagnosis, it's called misdiagnosis because of the assumption that this is a, a kind of <coughs> cultural confounder. Um, and second, again, there's a, a lot of controversy about the question of schizophrenia and violence. I've had some debates over email with Eva Lortori about this. But I would say that for me, the most convincing studies about the question of schizophrenia and violence really do point to um, uh, what I feel to be the fact that actually the popular stereotype of people being uh, violent with schizophrenia as an aggregate group are exactly at odds with what's happening in the real world. And for me, I, probably the most important set of studies was done by John Brecky and Kathy Prindle at the USC School of Social Work. They looked at actual police contacts in the, in the LA area between, I think it was 2000 and 2007. They looked at like six or 7,000 police contacts where somebody with schizophrenia was somehow involved in a crime. And what they found, you can see that number there, is that basically in the LA area over the seven year period, if you were diagnosed with schizophrenia and you were in, uh, involved in a crime, your chance was 65 to 130 percent that you were more likely to have the shit beaten out of you by someone else rather than that you were going to be the perpetrator of the crime. And of course this makes sense when we think about it because people with this illness are sometimes, you know, withdrawn or talking to themselves, but at least in the LA area, the, the stereotype was exactly at odds with what was happening in that if you had schizophrenia, you were far more likely to be the victim rather than the perpetrator of the crime. And so, of course, as people know, we've tried different kinds of things to deal with this, uh, training doctors in objective disease criteria, training in cultural competency, which I'll be just poking a teeny bit of fun at toward the very end of this talk, public information campaigns, and yet these perceptions not only persist, but they persist even though other stigmatizing indicators of mental illness have improved over the course of the last 50 years. And I say that because for people who know Lincoln Phelan's work at Columbia, basically they've done expansive surveys and they've got historical databases from the 1950s about popular attitudes about mental illness. And what they've shown is that at least in the United States over the past 50 years, questions about most other mental illnesses have shown less stigma. So if you ask people, would you want to live next door to somebody with depression? Would you let somebody with an anxiety disorder babysit your child? Would you want somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder to like be the detective on your crime you're solving or something like that, you know, that all these kind of things people have become much more comfortable with for a variety of reasons. But the one indicator that they found actually gets worse is would you sit next to somebody with schizophrenia on a bus or something like that. So there is this continued fear of schizophrenia and violence. And this is where I come in as someone who's both a psychiatrist and a cultural historian. And I say that in a way, just looking to psychiatry and really just looking at attitudes about mental illness doesn't help explain a shift. In fact, for me, a very important shift that's happened over the course of the past 50 years. And I say a shift because what's interesting, I think, from a historical perspective is that if you look at American cultural representations, I'll be showing you here in a minute, from the 19. 
up to the 1950s, there was not an assumption that schizophrenia was either a black or a violent disorder. And in fact, there was an assumption in American popular culture that schizophrenia was an illness that afflicted middle-class white women. And only in the 1960s and 1970s, for a variety of reasons that I'll be showing you over the next bit, a bit here, did we see the emergence of the angry black male schizophrenic male. It's something that only came up in the United States in popular culture and medical culture in the 60s and 70s. And what I argue in my book is that that's in part related to something happening in psychiatry, but it's also related to cultural anxieties about civil rights in general and black power in, in specific. And so I basically the kind of research I do, I do and the way I support that hypothesis is through a three-level analysis. First, I track changing American cultural representations of schizophrenia. And I look from the 1940s to the 1980s, mid-1980s, through a variety of sources, mainstream media, the black press, popular films, case studies in mainstream psychiatric journals, pharmaceutical advertisements, other kind of you know, cultural representations. The second part of my analysis is then I use the changing cultural history to then tell a story about what I thought was happening, what I think is happening at the Ionia State Hospital. And then the third part of my analysis is then to use this cultural and clinical history to then say a bit about how I think understanding history helps us understand stigma a bit better. So with that uh, in mind, let me just jump back and give you a, a quick example of the kind of sources that I use and the, the kind of materials I deal with. Now I guess, can everybody see that? But why don't we go back to the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, a, a time when really American culture, as I was suggesting before, had a very different set of cultural assumptions about what schizophrenia was and how people with schizophrenia acted. Um, first, American culture very frequently associated schizophrenia with great white male brilliance. And there were no, numerous studies basically in the American popular uh, media that basically talked about great white male poets, novelists, playwrights, other brilliant white men who not only had schizophrenia, and having schizophrenia actually gave them a leg up on their just normal competition who were also trying to write poems, but couldn't do it because they had schizophrenia, but it gave them the benefit of a particular symptom called grand eloquence, a propensity toward flowery prose that helped them kind of put their words in these creative terms. And this is from the New York Times from 1935. Now you might be thinking, we do think about mental illness and creativity together in the present day, but we think about it in relation to bipolar disorder. But it's important to note that bipolar disorder was a very tiny category at the time. Very few people got diagnosed with it. And schizophrenia was this incredibly broad category that contained, among other things, uh, the diagnosis uh, that was linked to creativity. An earlier term people might know for schizophrenia was dementia precox and it was assumed to result from conditions found in this seclusive, sensitive person with few friends who's been the model of behavior in childhood. So again, very different set of assumptions in the New York Times in 1929. Also in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, there were a series of articles in popular magazines like Collier's that basically asked middle-class white Americans to open their homes to people with schizophrenia. It basically said, invite them in as boarders or to share, share meals with them, let them stay with you. Again, and not a kind of rhetoric that you would see if you were in, in many way kind of afraid of these people. There were also these kind of hilarious, what were called schizophrenic biographies written by famous psychiatrists in the 30s and 40s where they would basically go back in time and diagnose famous historical figures with what they thought to be schizophrenia. And the two most kind of famous uh, biography subjects, one was T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who was assumed to kind of be sitting alone in his room and really sad and bummed. And then he would kind of jump up and travel across the world and prance around in the desert and kind of go wild. Uh, and people thought, oh yeah, that's schizophrenia. Again, it sounds mo much more to us like bipolar disorder, but at the time people thought this was schizophrenia. And the second was Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of the president. And the narrative here basically was that she had these very famous kind of crying spells. She would lock herself in the room at the White House. I guess I was saying yesterday it probably wasn't called the Lincoln bedroom at the time. It was whatever the bedroom was. Um, and uh, But then all of a sudden she would kind of jump up and go on these very, very famous spending sprees uh, in Washington where she would buy all these clothes she didn't need and spend all of the president's money. Now, for people who have read the recent biographies of Abraham Lincoln, we know that she was acting this way because Abe was <coughs> stepping out on her. Uh, but at the time, people thought that this was a case of schizophrenia. Uh, 
<laughs> schizophrenia, people literally n know, means split mind. And schizophrenia also was a very common trope in women's magazines. And so there were all these articles in magazines like Ladies Home Journal and Better Homes and Gardens that basically argued that the modern woman was being driven crazy by the pressures of kind of maintaining that role. And so women were being driven crazy by the pressure of having to take care of their children and be a perfect wife and do all this kind of stuff. And probably the most famous public airing of that was a 1948 Anatole Litvak film based on a 1946 Mary Jane Ward autobiographical novel called The Snake Pit. Anybody here seen The Snake Pit by any chance? Terrific movie, really important movie. We actually just showed it at Vanderbilt um, on the psych ward, which was a really interesting, uh, interesting experience. But for people who haven't seen it, I'm just going to quickly wreck it for you. Um, this is a film starring uh, Olivia de Havilland. And basically the story was that Olivia de Havilland's character was very successful. She was a published author and a writer. She was doing just fine. And then this guy starts showing up at her work. And this guy asks her to lunch and she says no, no, no. And then she makes this big mistake, which is she says yes. And then she makes an even bigger mistake, which is that she agrees to go to dinner with the guy. And then she makes the most fateful mistake possible, which is that she agrees to get married to this guy. Three days into her marriage, she has an outbreak of schizophrenia, which is manifest among other symptoms by her inability to recognize her husband, which is shown to be a surefire symptom of schizophrenia, which of course in the late 1940s meant that they cart her off to an asylum. And while she's in the asylum, for people who know the movie, they do all kinds of barbaric treatments to her. So they dunk her in a freezing cold jacuzzi, they spin her around, they do a bunch of other stuff, but far and away the most barbaric treatment they do is endless, endless, endless psychoanalysis. Uh, I'm just kidding, my, mo my mom's a psychoanalyst actually. Um, but uh, but uh, where they just force her again and again and again to talk endlessly about her parents and her upbringing and her childhood. And about every 20 minutes or so they bring her up uh, they, they bring her uh, the husband back in and they're like who is this man and she looks up with the kind of glassy eyes and she's like dude I have no idea which means that she still has schizophrenia finally <laughs> about 10 minutes to go 10 minutes to go in in the movie she has a big breakthrough I apologize to everybody but basically she realizes it's all about her father um, this means that she's kind of coming through a psychoanalysis they bring the husband back in she looks up and she's like darling, I love you, which means that she's cured. And in the final scene, you see the two boarding a bus and driving off away from the asylum and into the suburbs to reproduce, or whatever people did in the 1940s. <laughs> now, I am slightly making light of this film. I want to say that it was a very important uh, film at the time. There weren't a lot of people making films about state asylums or schizophrenia. But I will also say that it re replayed a very familiar iconographic uh, representational strategy at the time, which was this assumption of schizophrenia as being an illness of white, docile femininity in a way. And you can also see this representational strategy in very early pharmaceutical advertisements from the American Journal of Psychiatry. Here's a very, very early antipsychotic advertisement from 1951. And you can see it's a medication that we don't even think about anymore. And if we do, we think about it in relation to hypertension. But you can see that basically, um, at the time, there was this assumption that this medication was helping schizophrenic women suture away their symptoms with the help of these early psychotic drugs. Now, let me be very clear that in no way am I saying that all people who suffered from an illness called schizophrenia in the 1950s or 40s were members of a category called white. And in fact, if you look just by the numbers, there were entire so-called Southern Negro hospitals where schizophrenia really was the only diagnosis given to every single person in the entire hospital. What I am saying is that you wouldn't know that if you looked at American cultural representations in the 1920s through 40s, because schizophrenia really was presented as an illness of the white mainstream in ways that encouraged identification with certain groups of people and rendered other groups of people as invisible. Now, let's jump forward to the 1960s and 1970s. And I can tell you that pretty much everything I've told you uh, so far about schizophrenia pretty much goes out the window. And that if you look at American cultural representations in the 60s and 70s, all of a sudden you see the emergence of a new character, the angry, violent, black male schizophrenic subject. And this is a character who shows up across a wide array of representational strategies. One place certainly is in film. Uh, there's a still from a movie, a 1963 Samuel Fuller B-movie classic called Shock Corridor. Anybody here seen that film by any chance? 
Damn. Well, totally worth seeing, if for no other reason than the infamous trapped on a nympho ward scene, which is probably why it got all of its uh, uh, thing. But I would also say, I know, who, who hasn't been there? Um, uh, but uh, but I, I would also say that this is a film that w was another film about a psychiatric hospital. This is a film that was a, about a men's ward. And in the film, uh, the, the character, the kind of lead character who has schizophrenia is a character named Trent, played by an actor named Harry Rhodes, who you see there on your right. And what's important in this film is that this character, basically in the narrative of this story, was someone who had had a very successful childhood. He was a model student, a very kind of uh, obedient child to his parents, doing very well. And then as a teenager, he started going to meetings inspired by civil rights and Martin Luther King. And then he started protesting. And then he uh, actually was involved in a school desegregation protest and became a desegregationist. Segregator. And what happened in the narrative of the film is that the pressures of exerting civil rights became so powerful for him that it actually not only drove him to become crazy and develop schizophrenia, but he also became violent. And in the key f scene in the film, this character actually starts a race riot on the ward. Now, another place that you see this new character, the angry black male schizophrenic, uh, is in the FBI 10 Most Wanted lists that suddenly start to appear on the front pages of many American newspapers. And here, lo and behold, you see all of a sudden the emergence of these kind of angry black violent criminals on the loose. And another place, very interesting for me that you see this, is actually in case studies in psychiatric journals. So you see a lot of studies like this one from the American Journal of Psychiatry from the 1960s. And what was pretty interesting for me was that if you, uh, for example, pick up uh, the American Journal of Psychiatry as one example from the 1950s, and you um, read for race, you won't see any articles, hardly any, I mean very, very few, that talk about the race of the people with schizophrenia. The articles will just be, you know, this is an article about schizophrenia, and people with schizophrenia act this particular way. Uh, there was hardly any mention of the patient's race whatsoever in the 50s. All of a sudden in the 60s, you start to see these comparison studies, and they're studies that basically are comparing two groups of people, hallucinations and delusions in white and negro schizophrenics, a kind of comparison of two kinds of characters with schizophrenia. And I was wondering, like, why was it? Is there some reason why race became this comparative, uh, comparative analysis? And actually, it took me a while to figure out the answer, but the answer was that actually in the 1950s, they were doing all the research on segregated white-only wards. And all of a sudden in the 1960s, hospital wards become desegregated, and you see psychiatrists basically saying, well, that guy's diagnosed with schizophrenia, and that guy's diagnosed with schizophrenia, but those two guys don't look exactly the same to me, and so let's do some kind of comparison, and you would see publications like this that basically say, you know, the argument of these was that the white form was a kind of cerebral or intellectual decline, and the black form was a kind of bodily hostility where the guy kind of attacked his doctor or something like that. And so the question here is what, what happened? Why was it that schizophrenia shifted in such a short period of time? I mean, we're not talking more than 15 years here. And in the work that I do, I give three levels of analysis of why I think this was happening. And just given the time, I'm just going to very briefly mention two, and then I'll spend a bit more time on the third because I think it's more relevant to our clinical interests. But I'll just say briefly that one example that I don't have time to go into today is that schizophrenia in the 1960s became a very prevalent metaphor in American popular culture for talking not about mental illness but about race politics. And you see again and again in popular culture, in the book actually I have a quantitative analysis where I show that the term racial schizophrenia shows up only nine times in all of American media up till 1955, and between 1955 and 1960 shows up about 1,200 times. And you see it used it like it is in this 1966 New York Times article. This is an article about desegregation in the South, and you see states, towns, and even individuals seem torn by a sort of racial schizophrenia in which Negro equality is simultaneously accepted and reje rejected. Here, the schizophrenia is basically a split, not so much of the mind, but of the country that's split by a kind of polarized racial turmoil. A second example that I don't have time to go into today, and I apologize, is that schizophrenia is not just a top-down trope that's being used to pathologize civil rights. It's also a trope that appears within the rhetoric of civil rights itself, and in fact in ways that importantly help talk about some of the important philosophical divides in civil rights. And so on one hand, 
I've now got evidence of, I think, 16 or 17 of Martin Luther King's sermons or writings where he uses schizophrenia to talk about an ethical split in the black mind between violence and nonviolence. This example comes from his famous 1968 unfulfilled dream speech, his last speech at Ebenezer Baptist Church before being assassinated. And what King says is, there's a civil war going on in the, really in the black mind. There's a schizophrenia calling, going on within all of us, and there are times that all of us know somehow that there was a Mr. Hyde and a Dr. Jekyll in us. And what he's basically saying is almost a Du Boisian double consciousness type argument that there's a split and that we must choose the path of nonviolent resistance, which is one half. Conversely, schizophrenia was also a trope that appeared in the writings and speeches of Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Rat Brown, Greer and Cobbs, for people who know this book, uh, and other people <coughs> who were concerned not so much <coughs> with schizophrenia as nonviolence, but actually schizophrenia as a justification for fighting back against oppression. Uh, and so again and again, for example, who know Greer and Cobb's work, they would argue, yeah, black people are going crazy here, but either they're being driven crazy by living in a racist society and fighting back violently is actually the only way to stay sane. It's a survival strategy. Or yes, there's mental illness, but the el mental illness is white society itself. Either way, schizophrenia was seen as a different kind of pathology and, and one that's linked much more to a kind of survival strategy. But for me, as a clinician, the more, you know, the, the relevance of that for this audience is really the third explanatory reason for the racialization of schizophrenia, and it's really how this particular history, the politics of civil rights and what was happening in the 1960s, showed up, at least in the 1960s and 70s, in psychiatric discourse. The theme of my book, actually, was taken from a series of articles from the Archives of General Psychiatry written by two um, New York area psychiatrists, Bromberg and Simon, who had a series of articles in the Archives of General Psychiatry where basically what they argued <coughs> was that there were new kinds of patients showing up in psychiatric hospitals in the United States. And according to these guys, basically what was happening was that these new kind of patients that were showing up were all coming in, having changed their names to Islamic or African names. They were black and showing up with the sign of the clenched fist. And let me just read to you what they wrote. They said, in the, uh, again, archives in 1968, the particular symptomatology we have observed for which the term protest psychosis is suggested, is influenced by social pressures, the civil rights movement, dips into religious doctrine, the black Muslim group, is guided in content by African subcultural ideologies, and is colored by hostility, is colored by denial of Caucasian values and hostility thereto. This protest psychosis is virtually a repudiation of white civilization. So for people who didn't quite catch that, uh, what they're arguing is one of two things. Either that black people are be being driven crazy by participating in civil rights, or that black people have to be crazy for, being, for participating in civil rights in the first place. But either way, the symptoms that they're getting are not just like symptoms that are caught, uh, inflicting them, but actually a kind of projected anger onto the mores of white civilization. Now, I can't tell you how often that kind of kind of themology shows up really in the in the scientific literature search from the 60s and 70s. Some authors argued that if you were black and you participated in, in sit-ins, you were far more likely to develop schizophrenia. Other art art authors like Raskin, Cook, and Herman argued that if you were black in America and you simply thought that your civil rights were being violated, that you were at higher risk for schizophrenia. But probably for me, the most problematic place that these assumptions were showing up were in psychiatric journals, but not not just in the articles, but in the advertisements for new antipsychotic medications. Now, these advertisements were showing up again in the mid 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s. And remember, before these ads for earlier tranquilizers had shown white, kind of calm women sewing away their symptoms. All of a sudden, in the 60s and 70s, you see images that, I guess, for my reading, play off of some of the kind of African motif stuff about tribalism and stuff that were playing out in the rhetoric of kind of black power and black Muslims and stuff like that. And these, to, to, to understate greatly, were, to me, incredibly problematic. So you'd see ads for Stelazine that show these African masks. Some ads, like ones for 
uh, Thorazine, for the anthropologists in the crowd, used some of the most racist terminology in the English language and kind of referenced the, the divide between the kind of civilized and the primitive. But for me, the most problematic were a series of Haldol advertisements that showed up in the archives of general psychiatry starting in, in 1968. They basically were advertisements for the antipsychotic medication Haldol, which to me actually leave very little to the imagination. Again, these are ads from archives that showed up in the 1960s. And you can see here that this is, uh, presents a character who you might be thinking but are afraid to say it. Looks a great deal like the godfather of soul, James Brown. Uh, and there <laughs> actually is a reason for that. Uh, I, J James Brown actually had an FBI profile at the time that diagnosed him and Malcolm X and other people with schizophrenia, so I don't think that was an accident. Um, you also see here that this character has the physical sign of the clenched fist. But here it's not the solidarity kind of Mexico City Olympics clenched fist. Instead, it's an inverted uh, black power fist to say, I'm going to punch you in the nose. Uh, this is also not an image that appears, at least to me, in a, in a hospital setting. This person's wearing street clothes. And you can't really see it here, but the image is kind of hued orange on the page. And it's interesting to note, I think, that this ad shows up about three months after the Detroit riots. And so this assumption of kind of angry people in the streets would have, is something that would have had a lot of cultural re resonance at the time. And there's this assumption, assaultive and belligerent, cooperation, social cooperation, clinical cooperation, political cooperation, held all as the treatment in any case. Now, I'll just say that if you're doing a research project like I am and you've been on this project for a while and then you come across an ad like this and you're just like, oh my God, it's true, like this is really it. But there also were far more subtle things happening in the 60s that were less apparent. And one that I just want to mention is that there was an important change in psychiatric diagnostic terminology in the 60s that in fact helped some of this stuff happen, I, I think very unintentionally. The DSM-1 came out in 1952, and the first version of the DSM-1, for people who know, anybody here own a DSM-1 by any chance? If you do hold on to it, it's worth like 5,000 bucks. It's like this teeny little thing, but there are very few copies. But if you look in there, um, it, um, you know, schizophrenia was defined as what was called schizophrenic reaction, a psychoanalytically inflected term that talked about it as being kind of a mild personality condition. All of a sudden in 1968, again, a very powerful year, the DSM-2 comes out and there's new terminology in the category of paranoid schizophrenia and specifically hostile and aggressive attitude and projection. And the text in the, in the DSM-2 actually explains what that means and it sounds very familiar to what, what we just heard in that protest psychosis article, basically blaming other people for your problems. Now, I don't think that the makers of the DSM-2 were in any way trying to create a racialized problem. And I've done oral histories of people who worked on that document. And they all said, and I think very understandably and believably, we were trying to help people given the best science that we had at the time. But I will say that we're doing a big quantitative project uh, now, and there were very unintended consequences of this, uh, of this uh, rhetorical shift in which basically, don't worry about the chart, I'll just tell you that in psychiatric literature between like 1965 and 1979, if this language was showing up, nine out of 10 times it was showing up in an article that talks specifically about a black patient. So in, in many ways, what we see is, at least in this immediate time period, right after the DSM-2 comes out, um, at least some kind of unintended consequence in which people were given a way to talk about race under the guise of talking about mental illness. And for me, that's part of the explanatory model for why it was that the literature on race-based misdiagnosis actually starts in 1968, right after the DSM-2 comes out. So finally, uh, before I finish here, I've got just another five minutes. Is that okay? I don't know what, uh, what our time is. Um, but... Um, I'll say that I, I did this uh, project. Now, for people who know, I, I was working in Ionia, Michigan. For people who know, if you're from Michigan, you ask somebody where you're from, and they do this incredibly annoying thing, which is they don't tell you, oh, I'm from here. They give you the mitten thing, where everybody kind of hands up their hands like here. So I'll just tell you that Ionia is a town that's somewhere about the fourth metacarpal, about right there. And again, this was a very large hospital in the 1920s through the 1970s, about 450 acres, uh, roughly 400 of the acres were this pastoral farmland where people with criminal insanity would go and kind of work off their symptoms as if a kind of barbarian summer camp. And 50 of these acres were this kind of big, scary, gothic stone buildings. Now, I will say I went into the project thinking um, 
you know, an asylum was a horrible, terrible place to be, and certainly it was not a great place to be, but I was surprised that the levels of kind of activity there, there were tremendous investments in trying to restore people to being productive members of society. And so even though it was not a great place to be, there were endless, endless classes in vocational rehab, job interview skills, music lessons, and arts and crafts. So a lot of people were taught different kinds of crafts. And in fact, there was a kind of bustling market in the arts and crafts of Ionia's schizophrenia women. So here you can see the Michigan State Fair the Michigan State Fair from 1930. And every year the schizophrenic women of Ionia had these booths where they would sell their arts and crafts. And there was a tremendous demand for, uh, for these materials. Also, the women would spend the year making a float. And every year in the Michigan State Fair, there would be a float of Ionia's <laughs> schizophrenic women. Here you can see 1933. And they would all kind of be waving to Main Street, Michigan. I kind of, you kind of laugh and think, if we had a state hospital float in like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade right now, it would probably look incredibly different. But here, this made sense, again, because there was this assumption that these people were anything but hostile or threatening. In the 60s and 70s, also, all of a sudden, things change. You see a dramatic change in hospital architecture, much more the kind of one flew over the cuckoo's nest motif. And as I mentioned, this is accompanied by a change in the population of the hospital. So increasing, increasing numbers of African-American men come to the hospital. And when these men come, the people in Ionia aren't saying, let's bring these people out on shopping trips. Let's do arts and crafts. Instead, they were saying, these dudes might run away, and they're scary, and we don't want that. And so increasingly, you see moats put up around the hospital and barbed wire around the hospital. And you know where this story is going, which is that quite literally overnight in 1977, the, the Ionia State Hospital for the Criminally Insane becomes the Riverside Correctional Facility, a medium security prison for male offenders. Now let me say that uh, toward the end of my project, I actually had the, for me, the good fortune because the prison still stands. And I, uh, after years of pestering and then just flat out lying, I uh, was given 15 guided tours of the prison facility. And I, I'll just never forget this because... I'd spent like five years studying the hospital already, and I thought when I get up there, oh, it's going to be totally different. It changed. What they, they, the, what they call it is it changed um, from mental health to corrections. So it changed from mental health to corrections in 77. It's going to be totally different, but I just want to see the ground. And I'll never forget it when you go into a prison, for people who have done this, you know, they, they basically, you go through all the stuff, you sign the paperwork, they take out all your things, they wand the bejesus out of you, you go through all the stuff, and then they open the door into the thing, and I'll just never forget because it was absolutely like stepping back in time. All the buildings were still exactly the same, and they would show me around, and they'd be like, here's this, and I'm like, no, this was the men's ward. This is where they did ECT. This was the receiving hospital. But what was so interesting for me was that none of the guards actually knew that this place had been a psychiatric hospital, and they were like, what do you mean? This place used to be a hospital? I had no idea. And toward the end of my research, actually, these guards would email me and say, can you send me some pictures so I can show my wife, because I had no idea that this place used to be a hospital. And for me, this became a very powerful metaphor, this, this institution that functioned and stood and looked exactly like it did historically, but there was this institutional blockage that somehow created an institutionalized amnesia where people didn't know how it got to be the way it is. And in the book, I talk about that as a particular metaphor for understanding not just the ways in which these hospitals became prisons, but also for understanding the stigma issues that I talked about before, because I feel like these are issues that are in many ways are replicas are inflected or behaving th in ways that are tremendously influenced by the past but because we blocked access to the history of this stigma we don't know why it is that they act the way that they do and I in closing just want to say that I think that's important for a couple of reasons one is about the ways in which we intervene into psychiatric stigma and so uh, I think it's very important that organizations like NAMI and other institutions will make the argument that when we see cases like this one with the police, where police officers are stigmatizers, what we'll say is the answer to this needs to be that we train police officers that mental illness is real. It's just like cardiovascular disease or diabetes. It's some kind of biological, real medical thing. And of course, that's very true, and I completely believe that. But I would also stay from a historical perspective that you can see that <coughs> beliefs about mental illness wasn't the only thing shaping um, stigma against schizophrenia. And if you don't teach people that stigma with schizophrenia intersects with other kinds of stigmatization, notably race and racism and gender, and gender stereotype, then in a way you're only addressing part of how stigmatization forms.
A second is that uh, I'm doing this great project now with some of my students at Meharry. Two minutes? Okay, yeah, two minutes. Uh, we're great with my with Meharry, and we're doing this kind of music project. Uh, and what we're doing uh, is we are um, we are looking at the representational themes in American music. And I'll ma make a long story short here. We're doing these uh, analyses of popular lyrics. And if you l go to American popular lyrics and you type in the words depression or depressed into these databases, you'll get artists like America Stick, Celine Dion, Joni Mitchell, The Eagles, Annie DeFranco, other kind of like artists who sing like, oh, I got so depressed, I got so sad, and I wrote this song. If you type in schizophrenia or schizophrenic to these databases, I say with great apology to Tupac, whose words should never appear on a PowerPoint slide uh, at an <laughs> academic lecture, all of a sudden you see these hip-hop artists who are saying, yeah, I'm schizophrenic, but it doesn't mean I have a dopamine imbalance in my brain and I want some Haldol. Instead, it means I'm violent, and it actually makes me more violent and more threatening. And you could be, might be thinking, why is that? And in my work, I argue that it's not because of psychiatry. Instead, they're using the representation of schizophrenia that courses through black power that talks about violence and schizophrenia as a survival strategy, not as a mental illness. Very quickly, I'll just skip over that point. The last two points I want to make are, are just cultural competency. It's very important in a lot of ways, but a lot of times in cultural competency, we assume that race means the race of the doctor or the race of the patient. And we define competency as defined in the inter interaction of those two races. But when you do cultural history, you see that there's a third race that functions in the exam room, and that's the race of the diagnosis, and it needs to be taken account of uh, in, in more serious ways. And finally, this is a story about the criminalization of mental illness. If you went up to somebody in the 30s or 40s or 50s and you said, we put people with schizophrenia away, and you meant it in the way we mean it now, they wouldn't have known what you were talking about. But in the present day, according to Human Rights Watch, if you're, defined, if you're diagnosed with schizophrenia and you're in a state institution, the odds are four to one more likely that you're in a prison rather than in a psychiatric hospital. Now, there are a lot of reasons why that is, having to do with a whole host of other factors. But for me, it's also part and parcel of the transition that I've talked about here, which is a transition from understanding schizophrenia as an illness of, host uh, of uh, docility to hostility, and from an illness of us to an illness of them. Thank you. Great. I'm sorry I went on, but I have some time for questions, please. Yes? Yes. Um, are you saying that the rates of uh, violence and schizophrenia is the same as the general population? Oh, gosh, no. I, didn't, I did not say that. I did not say that. Yeah. 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 Right, right, no, no. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that these debates about people with schizophrenia as being, and again, there, there's a debate about this for people, who, for example, who know E. Fuller, e. Fuller Torrey's work. That to Torrey's basically arguing for subsets within the schizophrenia issue. What I'm saying is that the concerns about schizophrenic violence uh, far outstrip the actual incidence of, of violence. But I would also say that that's a very, I mean, if we had more time, I'd just say that that's a, a complicated question because the, de the definition of what violence is, if you're looking at this historically, and in, even in my hospital for the criminally insane, the idea of what counted or oops, okay, what counted as violence uh, in the hospital um, really changed over time. So they used to take account of like violent incidents in the hospital that I study, but the violence there was was violence about it was sexual violence pretty much until the 70s because people weren't afraid of people with schizophrenia. It, it, it was people with uh, sexual pedophiles uh, and stuff. So there are all these changes about demographics that, that go into this construction of what, what is violence. So what I'm trying to say is actually our, our link between particular kinds of violence and particular kinds of mental illness are things that are fluid and changing in time. So this clock's fast. We actually have four more minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Please. There's some correlates of violence to one, be homeless, two, uh, drug and alcohol use, and three, even the, the, the community you live in. And those elements would tend to skew people that have schizophrenia, which would be more homeless and 40, 50 percent use of drugs and alcohol, and, and live often in uh, communities where there's not a lot of stress. Absolutely. And I, again, I totally agree with that. I mean, I, you know, in a way, I, I'm in conversation with people like Arthur Whaley, who say that race-based misdiagnosis isn't a misdiagnosis at all. It's, in fact, a representation of things that are structural, in a way. You know, what I'm trying to intervene is, in is to say that somehow explains something to us about the neurobiology or schizophrenia, because, in a way, it gets us as psychiatrists into this funny position of, in a way, giving psychiatric diagnosis to social structural issues, things like racism and impoverishment and stuff like that. And so what, what I argue... If he was just at a conference I did in New York called Structural Competency. And I'm basically, you know, a bunch of 
us are taking on cultural competency to say it puts us in a hard position as psychiatrists because in a way we're asked to make a clinical diagnosis in the exam room but in a way a lot of these issues I mean we talked at the conference for example about not the issue of non-compliance and taking your medication with food and other kinds of things that in a way psychiatry like it was actually ideally <laughs> in the 70s far more interested in, in engaged with kind of structural level issues so we're trying to do this as a kind of critique really of the pol well, the politics of the AMA, um, but uh, but um, but you know. So in a way, I, I mean, I'm totally agreeing with you. I'm just saying that in a way, where we get in trouble is to say, and therefore, it's about dopamine, and really, it's about we need to invest more in infrastructure. There's also there's a question from one of the other sites here, from a resident. Any comment on ways the differential patterns of use of illicit drugs or the popular perception thereof may have contributed to the initiation or perpetuation of dissociation? of violent schizophrenia and black men. Well, I mean, I, I'll just take out the word drugs in that question. I'll just take a little bit of li liberty there. Because, again, I, I'm saying that in a way, you know, part of the intervention that I try to make when I talk, to, you know, it, it, you know, in in the psychiatry department when I teach residents is to say, you know, that in a way it's very important as psychiatrists were trained to see a clinical lens of things that are right in front of us. But there are, you know, you have to be engaged with social with the social context much more. And so part of this, of course, is, uh, you know, there are there is a long history of different, I mean, schizophrenia and the history of schizophrenia and certain drugs mimicking, uh, mimicking and be becoming, uh, you know, being diagnosed as schizophrenia is, of course, a, a long literature. And I, 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 in the last two minutes, I don't have time to get into that, except to say that, you know, part of what I'm trying to do is trouble the idea that there is a stable thing. If you look at this historically, a stable thing called schizophrenia that leads to a particular type of symptoms. And what I've tried to do here is, at least from a historical perspective, say that there are shifts in our definition of schizophrenia as psychiatrists that are in part clinical about people coming to us with these kind of problems, but they're part political, and that we need to be more aware, more aware of that kind of process. So certainly that's the case. But another way I could have told this very same story, think about like the drug ads, for example. This was also a story that changed not with the advent of illicit drugs, but with the advent of prescription drugs. Because in the 50s, for example, when people were using a lot of talk therapy, even in the asylums, um, the assumption that what we were trying to do was give people insight led to a certain set of kind of assumptions about schizophrenia. You can see in that Haldol ad, all of a sudden when Thorazine hit the scene, it all became about kind of bodily control. And that was, you know, again, a message that was changed. It was also co-opted by, by the pharmaceutical industry and stuff like that. And so in a way, this could also be a history in some ways of pharmaceuticals. I mean, if you think about like, you know, current literature on defiance and atypical antipsychotics and stuff like that. So it's, it's 1 o'clock now, so why don't we wrap up the formal part, but I think Dr. Mentel is happy to hang out. Please. If folks want to come and ask questions. Great. Uh, Thanks so much. Thanks.